Hey, Peter. All right. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, indeed. So I got a bit uh, distracted downstairs. A friend brought by an Oculus. So that became uh, interesting. Oh, that sounds very exciting. Yeah. Did Edgar you have to get a Facebook account for it? What's that? Did you have to get a Facebook account for it or no? Uh, he now works for Meta. He is, it is in charge of documentation. So um, I don't know actually if um, what kind of accounts. So we're just doing some of the game demos and videos. Quite impressive. Oh, very exciting. Yeah. So yeah, how how is your holiday so far? Oh, very good. Oh, and I wanted to put something new on your radar. Um, there's a movement afoot to organize a new world fair in the state. Okay. And I've been reaching out and talking to the organizer, and we're looking for pavilion ideas. And it might be interesting to have a tech-oriented pavilion, so you might want to put that on the back burner and give it a little thought. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe yeah, there's something for long-term radar. Have it in mind. Mow it over. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, sort of that's an interesting a, a challenge. Right on the history of language and text, and well, if I knew hypertext technology could work in, who knows? Uh, okay. They line us a bit uh, bad. What did you say? Uh, it can maybe have sort of a dark ride showing the history and evolution of language and text over the years, and I look forward as what kinds of issues are on the horizon, what kinds of technologies are emerging, you know, something like that. And it's just sort of popping around the back of my head. Mm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Because uh, the closest thing that we had was the Spaceship Earth communications variety at Epcot Center. So that sort of did like the history of language as it was going forward. But it wasn't very refined or deep in terms of substance. And it looks like the new fair people want to have everything be much deeper and more serious than past fairs. So it won't be just a place to go play and have fun. There'll be some real serious learning involved. Still fun, but you know, a bit of a deeper dive than past fairs have had. Yeah, that's that sounds interesting. A little beyond what I can think about now, but um, yeah, cool. Uh, that's a few years out, probably. So, just something to put in the back burner. Let's subconscious mull over it. Yeah. Hmm. Then I have all of the code written now, successfully importing the bibliometric feed from Zotoro. So I'll be able to start working on visualizations this week and pull it into the user interface. But all the data set. They say I pull in the data feeds and I go through and index them on all the relevant fields, um, make it nice and fast so that I can look things up and just basically go from an ID to the full record. And I have the Zotoro back end generating the coins format representation of the bibliographic entries, the formatted HTML representation of the entries, and I can pull all of that in and just splice that into the user interface. So I should make it nice and fast. Uh, the downside is there's like a 30 second lag when the initial feed comes in. At that point, it gets stored in local storage in the user's browser so that in the future, they'll only be looking at downloading the delta between the data sets they already have and new entries that have been added since the last visit. Right. And of course, if you start on the home page and you're like reading the text entry to the website, by the time you've read one page of text, the data will have all been down there complete anyhow, so that when you jump to the bibliography system section, it'll already be there and it'll just appear instantaneously. 
then we can have you know all the sources by author, uh, sources by publisher, sources by category, sources by tag, and start building in the linkages between the sources, which the Toro doesn't capture. Um, that sort of stuff that Mark Anderson's data set has in it. So I'll be looking for ways to try and layer that level of richness on top of the initial static tutorial bibliography. Mm. Yeah, that sounds like really cool. Um, I haven't done much with um, reference managers, but to be able to have that kind of uh, workflow is definitely uh, interesting. Of course, what I really want is to be able to simply grab the whole tutorial bibliography and drop it into author and then work from there when writing new papers. That's why I'm hoping that we can get the abstract field pulled in and I'll try to figure out what fields author is picking up and which fields it's missing on a few different representative entries. Yeah. Then there are two slightly different BibTeX representations of the Toro is generating. I have to try both of them. I only tried one in my initial test. So there's a BibTeX and then there's a BibLatex, which has slightly different fields that it exports. So I'll have to try a whole bunch of entries with both export formats and see which one author likes best. And then we can go from there. Yeah, that'll be an interesting test. That will be an interesting test. So where is everybody today? Is everybody on holiday, do you think? I think a lot of people uh, would have traveled. Oh, Brendel, you're here. So that what? answers that. Yeah, I was a bit late on the call today too because uh, <clears throat> wasting time with an Oculus Quest. Oh, good, congratulations. Um, yeah, definitely uh, try, uh, try some websites on this as well. Oh yeah, that's an interesting idea. Uh, if you have any um, addresses, please do send. And we did uh, some of the VR video first, and then we did the saber one with the red and the blue swords. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good demo. And then walk the plank, which was amusing. But then we did flying after that, where you have the two rockets in your hands. Very effective. Oh, interesting. So um, yeah, I'm just, there are lots of good entertainment. I'm just wondering how to, to do more of what you're doing, getting it into kind of our workflow. But yeah, it's a friend of mine. Yeah. He's, he now works for Meta. He's doing their documentation for this. Mm -hmm. So his job will be to make like a uh, Oculus magazine type thing. Oh, very That's interesting. interesting. Do you think they might theoretically be able to tie that in with the drone? So that you get a 3D view while controlling the drone and flying around in the real world? Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, uh, yes, that well, that that exists. That that's called uh, yeah, like first-person racing drones and stuff. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So the whole full Oculus immersion to get the three D view as if it was actually your head in the drone. Yes. So the, 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 it's called the, it's a fairly popular online. It's called FPV racing for first-person view. Um, uh, it tends not to be stereo, but because the requirement for stereo parallax is that you have two cameras set sort of uh, sort of adjacent to each other at about the interpupillary distance. Uh, it can be possible to kind of reconstruct synthetic views. And in fact, things like the Oculus Quest tend to do that because the cameras are not set exactly where the human eyes actually are. But uh, yeah, for, for the racing perspective, it's, it's, it's uh, monoscopic. So both eyes are being served the same thing, but uh, but people do some terrifying feats uh, through the, the views in the FPV drones. Um, it's really quite something to watch. Oh, wow, do you have a web link for that? Uh, hang on, this, this, uh, this is, I'm gonna turn off the blurry background. This is Keith. <laughs> I'm just going to go get another chair while he's- um, Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Oh, <laughs> Peter, I don't have a, a specific link, but uh, uh, if you, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get a, a link to one that is a, a good representation of. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, much appreciated.
Yeah, I'm still chomping at the bit for Apple to get around to come out with their VR regs. But I'll wait patiently until they come up with something. I think this looks like this could have looked good to me. Yeah, I see it. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, in terms of uh, other uh, applications that people have already started playing with and making, there's one called Noda VR, uh, N-O-D-A VR, uh, which is uh, in many regards like the uh, the word reality uh, demo I, I built a few years ago. It doesn't have all of the features and it's native. Uh, one of the things that I love, um, as can probably be evidenced by my work, is, is the web. But... Uh, uh, the, the things that people have done in Noda are also very interesting. Um, it's sort of understood to be for mind mapping. Uh, and I believe you need the, uh, the registered version to get unlimited um, voice recognition. Uh, but it, it is pretty, pretty neat. Oh, nice. Voice recognition for the mind map in VR? Is <laughs> yes, yeah. So you can do the, the text to speech. You're just typing, uh, well, typing on a quest is a non starter unless you um, uh, attach a wireless uh, or a Bluetooth keyboard. Um, but, uh, and, and so it, and unfortunately, the Oculus browser team still hasn't um, implemented uh, or, or sort of signed up to, to get text to speech through the browser. I, I feel like that's, that's something that I would love to push on them more for. Um, uh, uh, because I, I think that it's it's really valuable to be able to do that. And I'm not sure if they have synthetic speech speech synthesis because in a browser you can talk or in Chrome, at least you can you can talk and uh, the browser will recognize and then it will, it can talk back. So uh, I've written something just a basic proof of concept but for 3JS that that 3D library that I use WebGL uh, for WebGL um, to say like what is the what is the position of the camera? And it just tells you where it is in speech, which is neat, um, particularly in VR, because it means that you don't have to be pressing buttons uh, and you don't have to be looking in particular positions to be able to see. So, Brandel, I have a order of magnitude question type question. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't talk about anything specific about Apple, but this is for context. So I got into QuickTime when 64480 was pretty good definition, man. So it uh -huh. goes back to that. So if we look at um, Oculus, this one, as being early versions of QuickTime, when do, when do you think Apple might be ready to approve of something in terms of, will the visual quality be about the same as this or will it be just a lot better? I don't know if you're, you can even comment on that, but the reason I'm asking is for my kind of artistic background, that fidelity thing is really important. And today, well, in this world, I was shocked in a good way that the, the invisible walls that appear, I was just thinking there must be a lot of processing just to do those walls, let alone everything inside it. So that's why I was yeah. thinking with the M1 and all the amazing stuff Apple's doing, is it going to be like, well, there's a whole new level or not? Um, so uh, obviously, I can't. I can't really comment, um, uh, particularly with <laughs> if anything is recording. Um, but um, so one of the things I'm asking, I'm actually supposed to be working on my thesis, as you know. And yes. Earlier today, I was doing this, uh, doing. The concept mapping, it's a bit fake, of course, because I've done the work now, so I'm not learning as much, but it still is useful uh, to put things in a context. And uh, as you probably remember, black lines means this mentions the other thing, light gray means the other thing mentions it, right? But then you get into problems like this. These are the stuff of work. When I select mm -hmm. that, a lot of them refer to each other, so it's almost useless. I mean, it's nice you can move this in real time, but really we need the third dimension, an interactive mm. dimension here. Because I mean, look, this is the whole thing, right? 
th yeah. this is why I stopped doing it. And this is why I started doing it based on definitions. <laughs> but to be able to now explode that into a VR view, like last time we talked, Randall, you said uh, the data set just seems so much smaller. That's right, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's not a guarantee, but it is easier to peruse because you have the ability to, to generate a vantage point without having to manipulate a large number of things. So simply having a head that that is able to change the view rather than simply making it bigger or smaller um, is, is itself a, a really helpful thing because that's the way that we understand things. And that's why it's necessary to have a six degree of freedom tracking rather than three degree of freedom tracking. Three DOF is where you just turn the, the pitch of your head. Six DOF is where you have the ability to move in the scene as well. That's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, Oculus Go and other browsers, uh, other other devices that have only three degree of freedom are, are really not acceptable uh, as uh, as a as the first best foray, and why Google Cardboard was unfortunately, for all of its uh, validity, uh, for things like video, uh, not adequate for virtual reality per se. Um, yeah, so uh, so th this kind of thing is 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 uh, manifestly possible and 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 easy to make. Uh, Noda will allow you to build it. Um, uh, but uh, you could also construct it in in 3D in other things. I mean, you could make it in Blender um, pretty easily, and and then then uh, import it as a a model or something like that on on the on the web as well. But is um, does Apple have public APIs for head tracking using the FaceTime camera? Because I could imagine, you know, just moving my head here, and I have defined that some of these are further away. And that'll give me some degree of, um, uh, is that in the in research stages from a long time ago, or is that a real thing now? FaceTime on Mac, I believe no. Uh, 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 true depth, yes. So the true depth camera definitely has has the ability to do an, uh, actually it's called an AR session. Uh, and that's right you know, for, the, for the benefit of being able to do that. I don't believe that there's anything present on Mac for that. There are pretty uh, pretty readily available face tracking APIs for um, for native Mac and and for web actually. So people do a, a pretty good turn there. Uh, uh, but if you uh, if you want to play with it, there's also I don't have it on my desk at the moment, but there's something uh, called a Toby eye tracker T O B I I. Uh, and it's it's really good because uh, not only does it uh, track where your eyes are in terms of the the six degree of freedom space that they can be in, but it also tracks where your eyes are pointing. Uh, and so you just uh, glue it to the bottom of your monitor, affix it to the bottom of your monitor, and you have the ability to to create a fully eye tracked solution. Um, Oculus doesn't currently have eye tracking. Uh, it's it's uh, it's an obvious part of anybody's technological roadmap such that uh, it's been promised for the next one. Um, and uh, and it's present in the uh, the Vario uh, headset that I mentioned in the past. That it, that's very interesting in terms of what uh, extra intent uh, it gives you. Um, and yeah, so uh, to answer your question, nothing out of the box on Mac right now, but uh, yeah, you, you can do it uh, if you want with other libraries, some of them are I think on, and there will be a number of free native ones. Um, uh, and if you want to use somebody else's web library, Google has a number of things. Uh, yeah. Because it would be amazing if you could take that view and just move your head a bit, and then you can see the lines mm -hmm. behind are actually curved. Right. See mm -hmm. where the point, point Other things sort of, yeah. Yeah. Such yeah, th there was a, there was some really, really lovely uh, demonstration work from a PhD candidate about 10 years ago before before Facebook bought Seeing Machine Space <laughs> API um, of somebody uh, implementing um, using not even stereo, but just the, the head track uh, ability to be able to uh, enable um, the sort of the lean look in mm -hmm. Counter-Strike and other games so that uh, you okay. moved and you were able to look around windows and things like that. Uh, re really interesting, as well as uh, I'm not sure if he did it or if it was just self-evident from the work uh, to be able to peek around the side of Windows within your like Windows in the just uh, in the general sense. So it might have been in Mac OS 
but being able to peek around the side of them to, to see, because there are so many instances where you, you almost can tell what is on a window. Uh, but if, and if you were able to look around the side of it to, to see, um, then you'd be able to get a lot more out of the information space that you have on your, on your you know, Mac OS or Windows desktop. So uh, th those I think are, are, are really interesting, relatively obvious, and uh, yeah, they, they're a lot of fun to play with. So, cool. so what have you been working on around Christmas with your uh, air time? Yeah, personally, I, I've mostly been making things like ginger, real physical gingerbread houses. I have managed to um, um, uh, coerce my daughter into uh, using Blender a little bit um, so that she uh, develops enough proficiency in it that she can actually start having fun herself. She's not quite there yet, and so <clears throat> trying to trying to make sure that happens, we managed to make a Santa hat, and then I uh, I, I covered it in, uh, as a sort of an extra bonus. I covered it in fur so that she can see how exciting it is and how good good results can be when you when you <clears throat> take it a little bit further. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't I haven't done too much other than uh, looking at that data visualization that I mentioned about uh, the video transcripts. Nothing's jumping out at me as being obvious in terms of oh, I didn't link the video to it. Um, nothing's being super obvious to me in terms of uh, references to how how one might punctuate a, a, a video uh, and say this thing happens here, this thing happens here, because all of the keywords so far are so uh, uniformly scattered throughout at this point. Um, but uh, I think that's also because I haven't done that sort of um, term frequency in various documents frequency uh, sort of exclusion, uh, so that it's mostly the hundred most common words in the English language, and uh, they should be uniformly scattered. I'm just looking to see if I can find the the link to the video that I made on Friday of it. How about tongue clicks and whistles? But your line is a bit bad, Peter. What did you say? I said, how about tongue clicks or whistles? Uh, as an interface mechanism? Yeah. Hmm. Um, in terms of uh, being able to control a video as a, as, a, as a markup, or do you mean in terms of uh, uh, an, sort of an ex extant uh, system for people to be able to, uh, to use computers in, in general? That's uh, for indicating significant breaks in the video. Absolutely. I mean, if, if one had the uh, benefit of, hey, Alan, um, if one had the benefit of specific markdown uh, of like verbal uh, markdown, then one would have, it would be possible to, <laughs> um, it would be possible to, to identify those and, and uh, use them to punctuate and create stuff. I meant uh, absent and, and any other more specific things. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, you could uh, if you could use keywords if you had the uh, the wherewithal to uh, make sure that videos had them present. Oh, this thing moves Ver too quickly for you to be able to read any of those words. Verbal markdown. Uh, I would love to. Uh, it seems like I came in right at the wrong time. That's a topic that is uh, close to my heart. Uh, They're not spaceships, by the way, flying across the screen, Alan. I, I didn't. I'm, anyway, I'm glad. Sorry. You're wait. You're in the metaverse right now. No, we we <laughs> wish, but we. Uh, uh, Keith, Keith an old friend who is now actually Keith. Do you want to introduce yourself? What you're doing now? Um, yes, please. Um, sure, well, yeah, I, I'm for the past month. I've actually been. Um, I started a one-year contract at Meta. And it's with the Reality Labs, and uh, I'm a technical writer, one of two, and we're writing informational, educational, sort of external facing documents to build up a library so, to help people make better content. So it's, I mean, uh, my background is, is a lot of it is writing and education. So it's so, so up my street. I met him when he was the technical editor of Mac User Magazine. <laughs> So, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, as well as writing and yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you're, so. you're, uh, I mean, just to understand a little bit more, um, the, the nature of the, the writing, is it for 
developers to develop on Meta or is it for here, you know, business cases, here's what you can do with it? Well, there'll be some business case stuff like um, like case study stuff, but it's a lot of it is going to be uh, like tutorials, reference documents for creatives who want to create, whether it's like maybe studios that are already doing stuff and maybe they want to refine uh, certain aspects of, say, uh, ambisonics or, or whatever. But also, um, I'm going to be pushing a lot for this to be also aimed at um, general creatives that may say that maybe they do other stuff, they have clients, they'd like to be able to learn more about creating uh, immersive content. So this is a place where they would go to just read up on it, maybe follow a few step-by-step -step tutorials. Fantastic. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's really great. I and mean, the guy who's uh, behind it has been pushing for this for quite a long time. Uh, and it's just finally like everything's come together. So this is the right moment. Is that going to include, um, you know, given that that is a, an outreach, is that going to include feedback loops? Are you going to be able to hear comments and, and, and I don't know, is, is it just consumable or is there also going to be something where the audience says, well, why can't I do this? Uh, well, this is all part of the discussion uh, that we're doing right now, because one of the first things we have to do is establish the sort of the typical structure of these different kinds of documents uh, and then um, make a, a CMS uh, and a publishing platform that will support that, including sort of links out so you can say, OK, you've been reading this and now try it, try an example in a headset, hit button mm. it's a, uh, and yes i mean yeah I'll, that's actually a really useful thing to say okay feedback how did it go um comments corrections yeah so no it hasn't been so well, it's you, discussed, but definitely should be uh go ahead brendel i i so i i sit inside uh do you know if the organization is called developer relations and if we, what you'll be working on is developer publications or what what are the what are the specific sort of banners do you know uh at this point i don't um uh -huh. i think it's uh the in terms of i mean i've, I've been sort of uh, apple developer registered um sort of on the very mm -hmm. small, small soft level for a very long time what um, I know of the Apple developer relations is very much about uh, software development. This is more widespread. So we- I see, I see. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and one, one of the challenges is writing content that in some cases can have to be accessible and useful for somebody with a very high level of technical expertise and somebody else who's got lower level. So that's part huh. of the challenge of coming up with the right way of writing it and approaching it maybe- Yeah, you never like to chat about that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, well, I just said if you if you'd ever um, if you find uh, not sure where to go and ever like to chat about that, some background on uh, where I'm from currently, uh, and and this is sort of like why I was asking. I work at Twilio, and Twilio is in uh, very much I think had a very similar problem, but mm -hmm. its problem was. Uh, hey, there's this thing called SMS. We figured out a way to use it for companies, but nobody knows how to do that, right? No, nowadays, it's common. In fact, mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a glut. Um, but so our developer documentation goes all the way between, you know, marketers, C-suite to our core documentation for the first ten years was for developers, and we would have really the do a fantastic job of description on one side and code that follows you on the on the right hand side that is somewhat interactive but even that could be should be so much better and, mm -hmm. and it dovetails nicely into the talks that we have here where uh something more organic uh that isn't just uh comment sections like reddit but something where uh you could you could find a little bit more what, what you need to do um it, but I, I think that's like that's like platform level that's like stage three it sounds like where you're at matches very closely with where uh twilio uh was very comfortable for a good 10 years with just like here's what you can do with sms and video 
you know, yeah. and then, and here's how to actually set up the pipes and wires anyway. Yeah. yeah uh, it's That's exciting. interesting um, sort of talking about uh, having code in parallel with discursive stuff, um, which I think is likely to end up uh, sort of finding its way into mm -hmm. the whole spectrum of what we're doing. Nobody's talked about, um, code featuring in this but yeah it's it's going to have to even if it's just at the level of um, bits of javascript or um, maybe helpful code in terms of production as opposed to final deployment um, but, yeah you know, like the first couple of weeks was me finding my feet and learning all the different systems they've got and getting the, head, the hardware they send me to um, actually behave itself so it's yes it's really yeah onboarding is is a is a tricky business at this point uh, mm. no 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 end in sight um yeah so yeah, yeah uh, the the code and uh and prose uh, stuff that alan was uh, this, uh, describing um i think is also apt for the swift ui tutorials and i i i work oh. on getting the technologies available for that um really um uh, yeah 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 um we we, we internally we have this system called Anim system uh, at Apple, and it, it powers all of Apple.com. But uh, I'm we we worked. I worked with the developer on uh, on the developer.apple.com side and, and Dev Dev Pubs and Dev Rel uh, to get it so that it did the trick for her, so that we can have this stuff working. The, the next challenge for me is I want to make sure that it's easier to author, so that we can build sort of 10 times or 100 times the, the material like this, because I, I think that, that having, it, having it expressible is really interesting. But, but I'm also very interested um, to, uh, in what this looks like for a non-technical audience as well. If you have the ability to create a rich document of, of this kind, um, but it's not for looking at code, uh, but it's, 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 looking, it's for looking at other things, what, what does that look like? Um, oh, actually, uh, do you know, um, God, what's his name? Uh, Stephen Witten's um, uh, "Animating Your Way to Glory." Uh, it's it's probably the very the single best uh, example of this kind of stuff I've ever seen. The man has uh, unfortunately uh, turned um, internet troll and like alt right, uh, but but right, okay. was all was um, separate that. Animate your way to yeah. It's at echo dot net. Yeah. I'm just grabbing the link. Um, okay. Uh, so, Randall, did you when you were talking about the uh, the Swift, were you involved at all in the uh -huh. playgrounds? Swift playgrounds? With, yeah, yeah. The um, no. Okay, that well. Regardless, that's that's a fantastic example. My uh, it girlfriend is, it and is. I did that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it it was like educational and fun to <laughs> to go through it with a non programmer and like actually learn code i mean we, we, you know walking through the steps it's, it's an amazing tool yes absolutely i, I i'm uh, really impressed by it and uh, i feel like it's it's the way that that a lot of things should go um, this is working i wonder if it's because my gpu is busy that it's freaking out or if there's just simply been a regression or something but um yeah so this this animate your way to glory and, and in fact all of his technical posts, this guy, Stephen Witten's uh, on echo.net, as you can see from the top of this page, it's, yes. it's, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, this Mathbox uh, library that he's generated for it is also, I think, really interesting and really promising. So I'm not sure the scope of uh, your, your interactions with developers for the purposes of producing information, uh, but uh, you know, if you have the ability to create something that can uh, help to um, allow you to use prose to describe things uh, or, or markdown of some kind uh, to mm -hmm. be able to kind of change views. That I think that would be really, really interesting. Potentially even just using Mathbox. I've never tried <laughs> myself, um, but uh, um, let's see if, if it's That's Mathbox to presentation. The verbal markdown, going back to that for a moment, what was that uh, couched in? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I was just, I just linked, I'm not sure if you caught it or, or if you, or if you missed it, it was uh, the third, it was the link at 827, uh, the video transcript analysis, and I was talking about the fact that the 
the stuff which, which I, I see on the screen grab uh, that I it does support VR, but I haven't um, I haven't I haven't tried myself yet to see what it looks like. Um, but it uh, it was a uh, it's currently um, you can see in, in the video the, those lines are the the sort of the word frequency over time of all of the words, and then uh, you look down the left. Uh, they're, they're very small and, and dark and probably not even visible in any meaningful sense. But they're, they're all of the, the words that those are represent, representing. So it says kind and van and, and stuff. Um, uh, look, uh, verbal markdown would allow you to, to have much easier handles to identify uh, sections of a video. Um, and uh, we, we, you could use clicks and, 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 and pops and other sounds like that as well. But uh, simply having specific uh, specific keywords that you use to separate chapters um, would be uh, would be mm -hmm. perfectly mm -hmm. adequate as well so if you have a sort of a lexicon of of specific things that you want to do to or with a video then establishing those standards and circulating them would be i think more than adequate for, for making something happen so the equivalent of uh, uh when you say next line Right, it'll pop to the next line. Okay, great, great. Yeah, so if you were to just say new subject, uh, something, something, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, then you'd be able to, to, to have a first pass through through a, a, a verbal document like a video like this and figure out what to do. Love it. Yeah, so I, I promise I will stop playing that video game and then I will start looking at this again uh, because I think it is really interesting to, to, to think about what you can get out of these documents and what you can get out of video. I've been so excited about the fact that the transcript is available uh, directly in YouTube uh, and also you're, you're, um, you're, you're much more high fidelity transcripts for the, I think are, are really uh, appealing and promising as well. Yeah, I mean, the human ones, um, are, are good. They're expensive, of course, over time, but they're, they're useful. But the, even the YouTube ones are okay, I found, having to do some rough stuff. But just thinking about uh, what you and Peter were talking about earlier, the whole thing of having spoken commands, like you just used the word excited. It would be mm -hmm. interesting if it was an iterative process where we mm -hmm. decide in an initial vocabulary, like, this is interesting, you know, sentences like that. But then when we view we can go back and say, actually, a highlight in our community is wow, or dude, or whatever it might be. So you go mm -hmm. back and forth to pull that out. And then the kind of shape you showed was really, really cool. Uh, we just clicked on the video here. I'm just mm -hmm. playing with it. But also, I thought, because Keith, he used to be teaching also publishing. So I was talking to him a little bit today about our upcoming newsletter where we've got some good responses, by the way. I'll maybe share the spreadsheet with you guys later today. But um, um, one thing that will be quite cool with video transcripts, video transcripts are from conversations where you generally have people facing the camera to some degree, plus shared screen. That is the content. So the people facing are almost like icons or avatars. They're not actually that useful most of the time. The audio is. So I was just being a bit retro and thinking, making a magazine where on each page you have maybe like, we have frozen picture of Peter here today, right? So that's talk. And then we have whatever Peter said. But then if there's a screen sharing, suddenly you have bigger images, you know? So to try to really think it into the new medium, you know, like literally a, mm. a folding magazine. But there's so many different <laughs> shapes to go back to find. I'd like to lob a grenade into the topic, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, some of this reminds me of a, a, um, a project, uh, well, an idea that came from a project uh, that it, it may apply. Uh, we wound up calling it intonated text. And the idea is that uh, text messaging is uh, inherently uh, limited, uh, you know, vastly limited, considering that it's 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 considered it's it's pigeon language. First off, it's writing and speech uh, put through a an incredibly thin, uh, low fidelity channel. You know, uh, just in in the sense that it's words with no intonation. Uh, now we have emojis 
and we have these other uh, tools, gifts that help out with it, but those tend towards extremes. So what else could be done? Uh, Apple tried drawing that didn't really catch on, but I think that was on to something that was interesting, which would be this idea of intonated text where let's say that I'm running late to an appointment uh, and, and uh, the reply back is okay, but instead of just okay, the K is held down or uh, you, you write okay and then you swipe up or you, you just hold the screen longer, a long press. Right, no, but I'm talking about something different that actually changes the mm. uh, uh, visualization of the words is one approach, right? So if I just held down that K in yeah. OK, or, or rather what I'm doing is I'm holding down the screen, or let's say I write out an inside joke or make a reference to an inside joke, uh, and because it's among my friends, I have a little swirl shape that that shape doesn't convey, but that shape is the, the markup, if you will, to say this was the inside joke, right? The, the shape itself is invisible, but it, it, it carries it on to, to, the, to the people in the know. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have to just be displayed visually. It, could also, it also gives instructions for, as we're, if, we, if you have Siri read out a message, it suddenly has intonation on how to you know, is it going to say, okay, or mm -hmm. okay, you know, go ahead. Um, well, a couple of things. One very brief is uh, just that um, in Messenger, Facebook Messenger, press on the thumbs up, press hold, the thumb grows. So that's a very right. simple, right. sort of like baby right. step example of that general concept. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is on the radio this morning, radio for um, there's uh, somebody was being. You know, BBC Radio, where I was last week. You should all have listened to it. That I got to listen to it. it yes, is. I didn't yes. know. I continue. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> um, so somebody was talking about uh, text speak and uh, the millennial language, um, and I guess whatever the, the, the new generation, alpha, whatever is after that. Uh, and it, they were talking about people saying, okay which is like absolutely down to what you were saying, but the way that um, younger people allegedly are um, refining this is that if you say okay with just letters O and K, there's a different implied meaning to if you type okay, A, Y. And if you type in just like a capital K or a lowercase K or a mm -hmm, K, mm -hmm. uh, and they said like if, if, you, if somebody replies with a, a K and a full stop, that's like, yeah, right, okay. And it's like there'll be trouble later, kind of okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's that's that's the the pigeon aspect of it, right? Like that's yeah. our language evolving into this new form. Yes. The um, <laughs> the the underlying uh, aspect of it, where it might uh, apply as well to to VR to metaverse, maybe, is that the 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 thing that we are actually the meat of it that we are exploring is. Well, not only are we just typing with our hands and talking, that's one phenomenon. The more interesting phenomenon is that we actually have something in our hands that's far more expressive than a keyboard. And we haven't explored what that is any, yet as much. You know, we have, we're starting to, right? But this idea of long presses of, you know, imagine, imagine if our actual laptop keyboards understood long presses and delays. Mm -hmm. how would how would that change would we still need a full set of keys like this if there was an intelligent kind of uh mix between gp3 i'm guessing what your next proper statement might be but also you're holding and so now i'm jumping to something that's a little farther afield you know uh do, i'm not talking about getting rid of the keyboard but maybe the keyboard itself could be doing a lot more than it is, of course, and that becomes a question of, you know, sometimes, yeah, obviously, I won't bring up all the all the pitfalls. There's tons of pitfalls in, in yeah, that approach, yeah. but. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Uh, Doug had double click, but you could hit a character in between the two clicks to change the meaning of it. Mm. Right, so that, that, it. Goes, that goes far back. And I love the Apple trackpad, you know, to say, I can't use a mouse. You know, to yeah. take the hands of the keyboard and do this is ridiculous. But to do this is incredible. And today in Oculus, you know, to actually type, it wasn't that bad. But of course, we need to do better stuff. But, it's you know, rubbish. all the other interaction. 
No, but, uh, but also the, some of the early stuff you said, Alan, about the sound and intonations. When the first Apple Watch came out, I was just for fun developing a competitor that was just a coin you would put on, just mentally, not a real business idea. But um, it was a coin you would put under a normal watch. And all it would do is vibrate. And the vibrations would have almost a uh, Morse code language. Mm -hmm. I remember we were discussing this in Starbucks. I love yeah. that. It, it, we called it coin. It would be really cheap, cheap to make. And of course, you know. anyway, we, there were lots of ideas. But one of them is there's got to be a development of a language based on vibration. Apple is doing it now. And they, I think they're doing it really well. You know, I live with this thing. And I know most of the vibrations, what they mean. The one thing that I really want is exactly what you're talking about. If my wife replies to a message, I want to be able to understand it without looking at my watch. Yes. You know, right. if, if it's a positive or negative, you know, even if it's just positive or negative. So here I am presenting to someone and I get a buzz and I know that it's most likely from my wife. She's the most recent. I asked her, can you find my slides or whatever, something stressful? I want to know without looking. Is that a yes or is it a no? Okay, so to carry carry on, this, this is interesting. So for, for you, the watch, for me, the AirPods, I have these on almost all day because we're on Zoom, right? And I, I may have mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I can put it in much uh, grander relief, I think. How fantastic would it be if your wife messages you, uh, but uh, you get a ping at the top left if it's urgent, but if it's someone else and it's maybe just a, maybe your, your parents or something or some query like that, it's bottom right, you know, or behind you versus up here. And so you get a sense of this is something I need to respond to mm -hmm. without having to hear the message, right? Or you could get the tone too, you know, if it's, if it's from work, but it's congratulatory, then okay, I don't need it, right? Okay. This is the bit that's patentable because in that thinking, which I think is absolute genius, you can also encode time. So if you have an alert that sounds like it's here, you know it's five minutes. If it sounds like it's yes. here, it's about to happen. Yes. If it's behind exactly. you, what's going on, right? Hmm. Yeah, you're like already. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And then if, if you could set up like, uh, you know, so I've got these to-do lists that live across so many stupid apps. But if I had a basic area that was like, hey, here's, here's, uh, here's, me self centered right here's career stuff and here's home stuff right and then and then whether it's reminders or if i just asked you know what do i need to do next right you can get that you can mix that time sense of things that are urgent versus close plus a mass sense right like you have a lot of things to do over here right do you have, you have uh, several little, you have a scatter shot, a buck shot of things to do over here. Anyway, I'm just riffing, but- you No, can, no, no, that's a lot not of anyway, there. That, that's crucial. Uh, this is something that's come up a lot over the last few weeks. <laughs> so Edgar, trying to teach him things. One of the things to try to teach him is to be there for his friends, but not to be a pest, right? That's what humans are trying to figure out. Tempo and relationship, like us here, we speak twice a week, most of the time, and it's great, but very much, if you don't have a box of where you meet, you know, how, how do you know each other? How, how do you interact? You know, uh, mm -hmm. right? It's important both for individuals and organizations. Social media, one, doesn't deal with this. It's kind of like put it in a box, right? But, right. If, right. but if you look at the kind of thing you're talking about here, if you can somehow represent spaces of communications, you can somehow choose how deep you want to go, maybe even literally. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be situated here and there are other cues that are easy to read. Let's pretend we're all completely autistic. Many in, the, in this community are, but let's pretend that we are. And we need literal labels of people saying, not that interested in you. <laughs> or this right. person has really been reading what you've been writing. Raphael, that wasn't for you. That he... <laughs> <laughs> Raphael, that wasn't about you when he, when he just said, not that interested in you. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, that was <laughs> have my friend there we were just Welcome talking about board. social relationships and spaces and things and how and oh now he's gone i know it's just the picture <laughs> but, but to, to be able to to help people understand where they are in, in, in a relationship 
with someone. Anyway, lo lots of things. And anyway, Raphael, uh, Merry Christmas to you too and to everyone. Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> We've been, uh, th the day started with a spaceship. <laughs> That's That's like a special. So text in VR now. For... <laughs> yeah, no, VR is going to be interesting. But one of the things I think is interesting to go back to is that it isn't always about richness. One of the great benefits of text is that there is very low bandwidth. So there's very low interference. So if you want to do a certain kind of communication, you know, look at some of the, the Bronte sisters or whatever. Uh, you know, they partly managed to get successful because they were very careful what they put in their stories. A lot of the context from their background may actually have been negative, so to speak. So, you know, when we look at going rich and we look at going poor, uh, Keith, when we were teaching together, kept talking about appropriateness. It's like choosing a typeface. Sometimes you want it to be simple, right? Yeah, yes. that's true. Yeah. I warned everyone, I will be using this word a lot what's appropriate what's appropriate what's appropriate yeah. yeah we did actually teach together for a while that was uh <laughs> oh. that was a lifestyle yeah that was fun all the lovely students one of the things i was looking for and i failed to find uh there's a i thought it was uh tough tucker it might have been omar Ruiz one but I made a, a demo and it's very much like something that i've been toying with in my mind for several years of taking um so you know when you when you type on a keyboard um, a couple of things uh, are pieces of information that, that you have that you aren't typically conveyed. One of them is, uh, like you've mentioned, the speed of typing. So uh, being able to uh, have some representation of this, the rapidity that, with which one uh, character followed another. Uh, and uh, for, for my concept, I was playing with the idea of using the cant of the text. So how, how tilted, how, how uh, skewed it is uh, being proportionate to that so that uh, it would look messy obviously because people's uh, people's production of, of text isn't currently trained to the end of, of representing that that as uh, mm. being meaningful but also to take the volume of the keyboard uh, you don't have a microphone in your keyboard unless you have a laptop in which case that's typically where it is uh, but in in most cases if not all uh, people have a pretty ready access to a, a microphone that would be able to tell whether you made the, the slightest impression on a keyboard or really bashed it in. Uh, mm -hmm. And there have been a number of really uh, interesting and promising uh, mechanisms making use of uh, microphones, uh, contact microphones in other ways, uh, to, to make assessments about what it is that's come into contact with, a, for example, a smartphone. You can distinguish between uh, a thumb or a finger uh, you can distinguish between the, the nail and the fingertip. Um, but yeah, so, but, but using the, but just uh, to uh, go into uh, more like a typewriter where you can really smash the key and unless it's an electric typewriter um, versus, uh, versus a very gentle press. And so that you have the, both the speed and, the, and the, the pressure with which you apply it. Uh, because mm -hmm. I think that would be really interesting. Uh, I haven't finished making that before, but, um, but Omar, somebody, either you, Possibly Omar. I'm going to oh. take a look for it. I um, made a, made one where the the, the letters are, are stretched uh, proportionate to how long they are, so that it, it's more the the case that the letter um, lasts until you press the next letter, uh, mm. and so you can you end up with some really interesting and entertaining speech patterns uh, patterns of writing that are reflective of um, be interesting of what you did rather than what you meant to do. <laughs> mm. Let's put Omar Ruiz one on the list. Um, Go ahead. Uh, sorry, the the way I mean, like you mentioned, with uh, mechanical typewriters, like bashing the keys, the harder you hit the key, the heavier, relatively speaking, the character. So maybe you could translate that into speed, so like heavier or lighter. Like I remember reading about thoughts. the. Go ahead. Rolling the dice. Okay, Raphael. <laughs> I remember reading, uh, I think it's a website called dvzine.org, DVZine where they talk about the story of the Dvorak keyboard layout and how it came to be. Um, and it, it, it was talking about how in physical typewriters, um, because of the mechanical you know, composition of it, uh, they had to kind of scramble the letters to reduce the speed at which people were typing so it wouldn't jam the typewriters. And then 
that default of the QWERTY layout ended up sticking around, even though we don't have, mm. you know, the, the mechanical disability of, of letters sticking together now. And then this guy, Dvorak, came up with, you know, the, he did a bunch of research and he came up with a different uh, method of organizing the keys where he had, you know, uh, the most used um, uh, vowels in one hand and the most used consonants on the other hand. And you could, you would basically move your hand less. Because if you look in the keyboard right now, like you have E, U, I, and O on the top row and the home row is in the middle. It doesn't make any sense to have, you know, <laughs> most of the, <laughs> the vowels on yeah. the top. So, mm. um, uh, two, uh, and then, two, I mean, you know, talking oh, about ahead, how you know, the imprint of, go ahead. No, no you got it, Rafael. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I, before I forget, Omar Rizwan, I'd like to nominate to, to uh, possibly for a talk. He's fantastic, at least on Twitter. Uh, and I think he worked on Dreamland. Who is this? Uh, uh, Randall, is that who you're talking about? Oh, Omar Rizwan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he worked on a, uh, Brett Victor's uh, project. Um, and I think he, he would fit right in with these conversations. And uh, also it would be great to have him give a talk um, uh, in, this, in this vein. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on before I forgot, just for the sake of recording, because it touches on what I think is a theme that is important to me, but I also think it is a theme that is uh, central to future of text. And so uh, to, to put it blandly, it's this conflict space between deterministic legacy processes that we have today, right? Which would be coding, typewriters or, or keyboards, right? And then the probabilistic space of machine learning, right? Uh, the, the, the force press, the kinds of things that you can try and guess at human intent. But as we're mashing these two worlds together, we seem to have jumped the gun on how that can go together. Uh, and this, I'm sorry, this is gonna be a little uh, gammy what I'm gonna try and, and explain, but if I take the intonated text as an example, what I like about that is that it wasn't trying to figure out what the person wanted from how they were using their device. It was saying, we're giving you more uh, surface area to make your own language, to make your own meaning, which is something I love <laughs> about emojis and, and uh, yeah, and, and, and GIFs is that they are the opposite of predictive, you know, but, but they're also not deterministic. They're, they're non-convex, they're open-ended. They are the material of language, right? And, and so the conversation that I feel like has not found ground yet is how to use these, this new suite of tools, uh, this, this predictive stuff in a way that, gen that doesn't just predict what you're trying to do, right? or create a more cohesive frictionless experience, but in fact, gives you more canvas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally. That's something I'd love to explore as a theme somehow in, in, this, uh, in this next year. Yeah. Well, so what, one, of the, one of the challenges I think is associated with it is that uh, there's a hard cut for the most part between not necessarily the public, but but generally people's expectations of what is the way that we uh, in uh, expressed intent with a computer versus some of those softer, more um, in, inferable attributes of what it is that sort of intention and orientation is. So right now we click a button and that's amb unambiguous. We understand everything about what that button click is. We we don't we don't care about what it means, um, but we we have absolute confidence that, you know, that the user moved a mouse to a posis position on screen and clicked that button. Once you start uh, blowing that out into having a, a broader set, set of intentions or actions that you can then sort of apply intentionality to, the quality and the, the fidelity of the tracking and the expectation that those are gonna be repeatable drops through the floor very, very quickly. Yeah. You know, yeah. so 
And that, that, that's one of the things that you discover as you build things in VR, uh, as 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 it does when you when you build things for voice, is that the the level of confidence that you have in what it is that's being that's being tracked and the conclusions you can derive from that uh, begin to fall apart very very quickly. And that's where I, I, really, I really like. I really like. Um, I think I actually got the ten year award at WISP this year. The Proxamix Toolkit. No, no, actually, it was Connect Fusion that won the ten year award this year. Um, Anyway, uh, you know what you need to do is uh, have a, a bigger suite of mechanisms for sensing to be able to de detect those and then be able to make use of them. I think one of the things that you're talking about within the, uh, an open-ended system is is interesting. Is that if you leave the determination of what that means out and just carry that information through, then you you leave much more room for um, user and and multi-user social reinterpretation of what it is that intent actually is. And that, that's yes, one of the things yes. that I think is one of the things that I think is really interesting about uh, video. As you said, Frodo, like a lot of the what we do with our video channel isn't exceptionally well used right now. That's in large part because we we don't have any mechanisms for replaying that and what we do have replayed in the video window isn't phenomenal. But if we were co-present in the way that VR chat has um, it's, not, it's okay. It's not an amazing app, but it's 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 pretty good. Um, and then you know we would be using our hands, and we would be sort of uh, leaning a little bit more on what we what we get um, in 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 the real world as we interact. Sorry, uh, I went on, but go ahead, Raphael. No, no, no. Hang on, Raphael. But before you go, just, just quickly, uh, two things on the list here of people. Um, Richard Saul Werman also wants to join us. He founded the tech hey. conferences. An interesting That's thing really about exciting. him, he's also a best-selling multiple book author, but he doesn't write anything. It's all transcribed. And also, uh, one of the things that came out of, I think it was the my radio thing, I got an email from the publisher at the National University of Singapore. Some of you may have seen the email saying he wants to do visual meta stuff. And one of the things he wants to do with that, he wants to hash the main document. This is exactly what Peter's been talking about and then add an appendix after that that refers to the previous part of the PDF. But what we could maybe also do, and Brandel, you kind of killed my point a little bit, but imagine when an author writing a document, uh, that not necessarily key logged, but you log the, the tempo and everything, because then you will have a signature of how that author types. So if that is done, and if the software can then safely hash that somehow, and put that in the visual meta, then you have another layer of this person actually wrote that. Yes, Robert. Yes, absolutely. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, there's a website called uh, textfiles.com. It's, it's by Jason Scott, who works at the Internet Archive. And he, com he basically saves, you know, uh, it's an archive of text files from the beginning of the web. And there's a, there's a file called um, emoticons.txt where people are talking about these things that have been surging, that have been appearing on, on, on the bulletin board systems and that people have been using. And I think it connects with what you know, Alan uh, was saying about emoji. So it's an interesting piece of history on, on the use of emoji on as text on the web. And I'll share the link oh, in the chat. Yeah, chat. thank you. The earliest um, I've tracked down the use of um, ASCII style emojis uh, is way before ASCII. As uh, Puck magazine in 18, the 1880s. Uh, 18, till, yeah, oh. basically creating faces the way we do on keyboards. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually using those to um, signify emotions. And also telegraph <coughs> operators would do that. So Ooh, I want to see yes, that. <laughs> yes, I love I, that. I think one mm -hmm. of the things we're trying to do here is the discussions we have together. What do you want to do? Uh, just no, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, no, it's just yeah. Is we, I think one of the things we want to do is basically have a chat like this, record it somehow with richness, so we can then later find relevant bits, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I love the, the big names that you're getting in on this. I'm really impressed. Um, I would love to see a site 
uh, I'll, I'll throw aside all other real world, uh, you know, uh, bottlenecks, but I would love to see a site where these transcripts or these interviews happen, but also, you know, I could go there and create my own narrative by pulling in quotes and ideas and comments from the various talks, right? Even if it's just a narrative that is like five, uh, a, a tree with five stems uh, um, that, that says, hey, these things link together in a way and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this into the forest of embodied cognition or something. I don't know what I'm really trying to say there, but I, I'd love to see something uh, where it isn't just an experience where people see someone talk or have this conversation, but they can go in after the fact and turn that those those ideas into their own fodder. So on that note, this is a Ziotag, which is a recording system for Zoom, and then it transcribes and does that kind of stuff. It's invested uh, by Esther Dyson. So I had a chat with her last week. And once I'm done with the PhD, she wants me to talk to them about how the reports they generate can use visual meta. So I'm highlighting it partly as, you know, there is some work done in this space, but it's still pretty, pretty poor. And I think we need to develop open standards for how to share that kind of stuff. And I think the richness of the conversation today about what should we actually capture is really, really important, both in terms of typing. And I mean, you've all seen these videos of uh, being, you know, <laughs> cameras that can be decoded to see breathing just normal video cameras, the way that it's processed. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that can be get, gotten from our faces right now as well. Right. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that really bugs me when people talk about fidelity within things like virtual reality, but also generally with, with pixels is that when we, when, what we do with that fidelity is that uh, when we're in, uh, in uh, we're, when we're co-present with each other, um, so you know that's what you're talking about is mm -hmm. is, is called Eulerian magnification, um, the the process of looking at the subtle changes in red, green, blue channels just over a normal camera, and being able to identify. Everybody familiar with this? Am I just explaining to the audience? Anyway, no, no. Um, uh, so it, it, it you can you can look at the changes in things like peripheral circulation because there are you you may not be able to consciously notice that I. Uh, have uh, changes in the red, green, and blue of my face, but they are nevertheless there even on this video feed to such an extent that particularly if you stabilize the video, you'd be able to have a sense of what my pulse is, as well as some aspects of the quality of my peripheral circulation, in fact. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about that is uh, that it's, it is actually detectable uh, for humans um, with each other when they're co-present. And if you oscillate and vary the uh, presence, uh, the, the, the appearance of uh, a person's avatar in, that, in those color channels uh, in synchronicity with a person's own, with, a, with an observer's own view, mm -hmm. then they are happier interacting with that than if it's out of phase or if it's absent. Uh, so the thing is that, that fidelity of the kind that we get from real life it's useful, but Half-Life Alex gets it wrong in that it was sorry, high fidelity sort of video game VR gets it wrong in that it thinks that the, the fidelity is the point rather than the information that we derive from it. You know, exactly. high, high fidelity. And the, the issue that I have with the video, video games right now is that they understand that fidelity is good per se, but then they don't say, well, actually what's important is what we derive from it. And so having a higher fidelity video feed is less important than being able to understand what it is that my actions were at the specific moments. And so having something like Memoji, having something like uh, a higher fidelity hand tracking that is able to, to really hone in on what it is that my hands are doing would be much, much better than any kind of 1080p, you know, uh, or, or higher, you know, like 2K, 4K, whatever. Webcam is less important than what are my hands doing? You know, what is my pulse doing? And so if you have the ability to, uh, to, to look at what it is that people notice about people, what it is that people notice about the world, and then put that into the computer, then that is much more important as a goal than simply putting more pixels or a higher frame rate or anything like that. By the way, Raphael, is your hand up or is it up from earlier? 
I wasn't. It was oh, up from earlier. Sorry. It up or if it's up fresh. I forgot it. Up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's fine. Uh, so one thing that I want to come back to at this point, because we're over time, which is fine. Um, I had one of Edgar's friends and parents over for dinner yesterday for Boxing Day. It was all very lovely. Then I found out that he was a former researcher, actually a top researcher within cancer, which is very relevant. I mean, Keith Hare was given terminal cancer <laughs> and he survived. It is all gone. So there are, you know, yeah. things that happen are wow. very, very That's good. Awesome. But, but it turns out that this guy who really, he works at the molecular level. He's done amazing work. The managers in the field, they were just absolute horrible witches. There were ladies, that's why I'm using that term. He just had to leave, he just had to get out. It was awful. So academia has lost him. He's now doing other things because of that. It was just the working thing. And then we look at all the problems with normal academia, you know, universities. I know Peter's very interested in, in redoing it. When I talk to a lot of the people for my expert interviews, including Esther Dyson, and I talk about you know author reader being for academia, they say, oh, that's great, but the companies I work with are getting out of academia. First of all, there isn't money there for these things. Secondly, academia now is very much purely commercial, teach the courses that make money and get out. My <laughs> university in Southampton is a lot of Chinese girls, nothing wrong with Chinese girls, but they're all sent to Europe to learn accounting to go back. They make the money, so everything else gets neglected. These are real and important issues. So I think all the stuff we're talking about here, I think we every once in a while need to kind of swing back to the whole, we are actually trying to provide tools for thought. We are actually trying to augment communication. Just as little tenfold, this is something we all agree on. It's just not nice to come back to that. Otherwise it becomes details for, them, for their own self. You know what I mean? Yeah, Fred, you just blew my mind. Uh, I, I know we're over time, but I do, I do want to touch on that more because I, I have no, um, everything that you just said about academia is kind of mind blowing, but it makes perfect sense. It's awful. Uh, I, and, and that's, that's changing my understanding of, of other, of other rotations in the world. So I got to process that, but I'd love to learn more. I don't know, I, I guess about that, like, well, Huh. Maybe that's why these <laughs> salons are popping up everywhere, right? Like, is this is this a is what we're doing? Is this a response to I, I, the, the vacuum? I think it is, but I think McLuhan would have loved it because things will reverse in on themselves. You know, the tetrad analysis and all of that stuff. You know, he said, in the age of automation, we will all become our own secretaries. Well, duh. You know that <laughs> happened. But I also think that the more tools we have to understand, the more tools we have for ignorance. One of the things I talked about yeah. with guy yesterday, his name is Ming, Ming the Merciful, I love calling him, is um, there are so many ways to cite and find research now. It actually means that people cite less widely. They go to the canonical sources more. That's been studied. That's really scary. So minds are narrowing. So, you know, two days ago, we sent the Webb, James Webb telescope up. The greatest thing humanity has possibly ever done. And then we look at some of our own politics, which is just ridiculously stupid, right? So it seems to be as something goes strong, the opposite will go strong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. we have these insanely powerful devices, almost everybody. And what does that mean? At the same time, we have education being turned much more into a cookie cutter thing. It's crazy, but it's kind of our responsibility to provide the infrastructures that, you know, somebody like my son, Edgar, you know, how do we want him to be able to communicate when he grows up? And the richness of what you guys are talking about is absolutely crazy. But how do we harness that? My fear is that, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing with author and reader, I'm comfortable saying that I think it's better than Word for a lot of use cases. I'm in a group of friends, I can say that. But it's a bit late. How, you know, it's going to cost me millions to market it to the point where it'll even have a dent in the market. So that's why it's so fortuitous that Brendel has joined us and that Keith is now working with Meta for these things because VR will happen. And if it doesn't have initial applications that are really, truly different and powerful, we're going to have cultural impressions mm -hmm. of what it is very quickly, like how Word completely ruined word processing. 
how the web browser ruined the web, so to speak. <laughs> but I don't think we can afford that in VR. We don't want it to look like Zuckerberg sit down around a table with a campfire in the background. We, it can't be that for the public. Speech over. That brings a, uh, comes around to, uh, I hate to say it, but Web3 and the small blowback of Dorsey and, and, and Musk. Yeah, I know, Randall, I'm sorry, but, uh, but, it, but okay. it, it, I, I, I bring it up because it's another case of, well, um, I actually have a lot of questions about it, but one of my concerns is that there's like digital native means in some ways digital naive where um, <laughs> where you're, because because you've gotten so used to the systems and platforms that are already sophisticated and and work almost all of the time that you yeah. assume you can innovate on top of it without recognizing the platforms and protocol layers beneath that that have hard physical limits um, but I, but I don't want to sound old man about that uh, just because I mean I, I only know it maybe slightly more because of my time at Twilio, but I am interested in how how these how these new conversations of what's possible. And so this does this does a sort of it, in in this weird way, VR Meta is is similar to Web three in the sense that they are new initiatives where anything seems possible. VR has a much longer pedigree uh, and, and and understanding of the channel constraints, you know. Mm -hmm. Than, than Web3, but there, I don't know, I, I, I guess I bring that up because that is typically where you get the bad result that we're stuck with, you know, is when sometimes you have good civil engineering, sometimes you have, I, I think the keyboard is an excellent example. Um, other times you're stuck with systems that are, are uh, pretty chunky and I don't know how to end that sentence. So I'm going to stop. Yeah. So in terms of where, where VR is going, what I urgently want is something that is, uh, you know, for, for better or worse, more like the word processor than Beat Saber or, or super hot VR. And, and I think that it's, it, it's imperative for the platform for people to recognize the validity and value of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, it, it wasn't as, as awesome as, you know, Pong or, or any of the late 1970s innovations in, in personal computing where what really made the computer work was, it wasn't even Apple per se, but it was VisiCalc. Uh, for mm -hmm. those not familiar, v VisiCalc was the first yes. visual spreadsheet system. Yep. And it, it caused the Apple Computer Corporation to go from just another one of the, the many, many computer companies around to being a, a billion dollar uh, mm -hmm. company within, within months, I, I believe. Um, and in the, that same way, for, for, for better and worse, the Microsoft Word uh, and the, the primacy that it achieved uh, was it, uh, like um, instrumental in, in cementing not just Microsoft, but also the PC as a, as a platform for, for living on. Uh, and so something that a lot of people forget is that while computers can be for entertainment and they can be for curing cancer, they can also be for doing the books. Uh, at a at a local corner store, and that's that's really important to to remember. So go ahead, yes. Rose. Yeah, I've got my real hand up. Um, so Scully did the Knowledge Navigator video. Yes. Yep. Was, even at the time, I thought it was a bit ridiculous because it was basically talk to an assistant and you get stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was at least an experiment and a vision. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Brandel, I think you should get them um, to budget for Apple to make a video like that for VR, but make it open, make it with others. Yeah. So it's like a yeah. new web, but, but make it from that, the consumer side, you know, make it like the, the Zuckerberg, but before anything is even announced, <laughs> you know, because j just the basic thing of, you know, I want to be able to, having played with the Oculus because of Keith today, I want to be able to go downstairs into the living room. Says, "Sorry, Emily. You know my wife's name is Emily. You probably all know. Uh, I'm a bit busy. I have to do real work now. Right? I'm not going into game. I have to do real work and get into the space that we're all dreamt about. But other than you, Brandel, for most of us, it's really abstract. You know, I want to be able to generally sit down because you're not going to stand up all day. And I want to be able to have all these spaces. So one perceptual thing would be kind of modular." like um, Alan goes on and on, 
about having different spaces, having different values. I completely agree with that. Your kitchen, so to speak, is over there, right? So this is the web here, mm -hmm. whatever it is, but just establish that. You know, because of Fitz law, Apple has top of the screen, that's where the menu items are. You know, Microsoft didn't want to copy it, but to get some of those things in, so that I can say that, you know, physical spreadsheet thing, I want that here in three plus dimensions, but that's kind of in this space or whatever. We need to start imagining together. Mm -hmm. One thing oh. I've been uh, uh, discussing with a couple of friends, and I've raised it uh, at Meta. Is, um, well, I've been involved in VR conferences, um, sort of mainly photographic and video, three hundred and sixty content, um, and of course there hasn't been one for all the logical reasons. Uh, I, I, so why don't we do one in in a uh, Quest Horizon space? Um, I've no idea how well that could or would work. But I think rather than saying, okay, everyone pay for the tickets because we've got to pay for spaces and catering and all that, no, pay for your own Quest headset, register for the conference. And I mean, what better topic for a conference in a VR space than people who are obsessed with VR? Yeah, I haven't gone through the, the full proceedings, but the, the, the mm -hmm. ACM, is it IEEE or ACM? Uh, the v VR Software and Technology Conference was, uh, I think, like last week. Uh, the, you know, uh, uh, intelligent, oh, it was Intelligent Surfaces and Systems, I think, ISS. Was the, there's, there's a link that I want to give you, Alan, um, about um, mm -hmm. deciding on positions for play things to go and deciding on, based on different contexts, where you might put those places things. So if you have a physical timekeeping device, on a desk then you put stuff that's around temporality and then if you go to another place then it tries to identify where the clocky thing is so that you can put the same stuff around the same kind of thing you know playing off whether the, 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 the core low-level proprioceptive kind of representation of like i want things to my left here versus i want things to be bound to the concept of time hopefully if you if you really like time being on your left there then you will make sure that the clock is always there and so that there's constant uh, mm -hmm. consistency. I was looking through the uh, Augmented Humans Conference, but it doesn't yeah. appear to be there. It, it might be in uh, in ISS. Well, that's a classic case of, yeah, we do that naturally in reality. So it is uh -huh. a logical extension of mm -hmm. what we've grown up doing. One of the, um, uh, first of all, I, lo I love the VR for word processing. I'm 100%, I'll follow you to hell, uh, you know, to, to make that happen. I, I so want that. Um, a, a quick story about my last time in Oculus. I have one, and I haven't I haven't gone in there in about a year, and I'm a little embarrassed to say why. Um, but I, I think it's important to talk about because there is a degree of it that just seems like you just have to be able to jump off the deep end, right? You have to be able to do the deep dive. Um, I guess, but my last time in there, I, a friend was, you know, I'd had it, I played around, I was just kind of seeing things, but my friend was like, it's totally different once you go to a place with other people. So let's let's go do that, right? So I was like, okay, all right. And then we, we had trouble connecting, so we were in two totally different worlds, but I'm in this world and now I'm talking with this guy and his kids, I guess they're his kids, but they're children and they're running around and they're physically running around me. And I'm like, I don't, it, it was, it was a, a, an overwhelm of my senses because I had no idea if this person was real or, or if these kids were actually kids or if I was part of some sort of weird, mm -hmm. you know, and then I didn't know what to say to them because <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, like there was, my head was just exploding. So I haven't gone back in out of necessarily fear or embarrassment, but it was just like, okay, that was a yeah. totally different world and, yeah. and it's exciting but it yeah. makes me think that like i wish there was a, a way of uh, to mix a little bit of that uh, uh word processing mentality something but like i wish rather than jumping to a portal to a room i could sort of start to walk towards a place and kind of see the distribution of people that i'm walking towards you know in a mm -hmm. sense uh, 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 uh abstracted away in a sense of like this is a rough and tumble crew. There's a lot of people over here, you know, and so then I could maybe drift into another direction, you know, yeah. some wayfinding. 
There is something anyway. similar to that, uh, the Horizon Worlds thing, the, the various Horizon things uh, in the, uh, the Oculus uh, environment. Um, I mean, it, it's it's very basic in terms of graphics, um, but yeah, it kind of is a bit like what you're describing. You have a big space with different things, and there are portals that you can go to, and they've got signs so you can choose whether you're going to like the hangout space with a VR fire roaring in a corner, or watching a band. Oh, I mean, or, I mean the opposite of that. But but the, but there's the the big space where you're milling around. You can see groups of people all sort of moving about and then clumping together and chatting. And you hear people talking over there. You hear somebody there. You suddenly hear something close by you there because somebody's just walked beyond what, what the... Right, right. Um, and then you hear some <laughs> some kid making fart noises. And, yeah, because the problem is the same, yeah. I think your concern is really deeply human because, you know, online you can uh, download pictures of uh, ladies with no clothes on. And people, of course, do that. But also, there are sites where you go see ladies with no clothes on live. Why do they exist? Right. There's no financial or logical reason they should exist. If there are pictures there, go look at the picture. Why in the world would you need to pay quite a lot of money to see them live? Oh, so the human that's interesting. Need, yeah, okay. We need mm -hmm. the human connection, right? So if you're in, 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 other than a run around and shoot people game where you don't really care who they are, you want to have a sense of who that is. Of course, you can go to a game where you can be a scary monster or anything, but that should be its own thing. When you yeah. go to meet people and you're not sure, is there one person there, is there two people? It just disconnects, but also really <laughs> important. I really want you guys to start reading this. Okay. That is okay. I think you're going so to bubble it up because the, the, the <laughs> bit that I just read, and I'm only this far in, is on... Uh, human subjectivity of how we imagine ourselves being somewhere that we have to have the mind so we can imagine a dead body an empty body but not an empty mind right so a little bit like barbara tversky's embodied cognition this goes from cells and upwards in stages of and it doesn't just look at the biology it looks like the history of philosophy of how ideas tend to bounce back and forth and when we're going into VR, we have the opportunity to reinvent a lot of, you know, quote unquote reality. Yeah. yeah. So to get this, it's- Is that the guy who wrote Other Minds? So beautifully, beautifully. That does Zoa. Is it the guy who wrote Other bit. Minds? Yes, he is the squid guy. Okay. When I keep He's thinking about, <laughs> when I think about VR, it's, um, it, it doesn't seem to be here yet. And I hate the fact that you need another device to go into this environment. And just the fact of needing to have another device just means that it's, it's going to be something, you know, for the 1%. So mm -hmm. it's not going to have a, a global impact. I don't, I don't think everybody's going to have you know, a phone and a VR glasses. Or well, it's I, it's I, not well, going to be just all, one thing. With all your loving respect, I think you're completely wrong. Because first of all, VR is already here. We're already on it right now in this conversation, right? It's very much yeah. a conversation about how it's just an incredibly tacky screen. Yeah, well, my, sure. But I think I think that's I think it's different than VR. I think it's the, we're talking through an interface, right? And um, because, for example, when when I think about VR, um, it's always a matter of of um, it, it reminds me of the battle between HD DVD and Blu-ray, and Blu-ray one, and then nobody you know. HD DVD doesn't exist anymore. But um, while we don't reach a point where you know, everybody has, um, has glasses or a way of entering VR, uh, AR, I think, is going to be the main, uh, the main way of augmenting the world around us. Because we're still in the physical space, but we're getting yeah. more out of it. Sure. Right? Oh, if you, if you uh, want to take that tack, I, I don't, I don't, when I talk about VR, I really don't draw any distinction between AR and VR. I don't, I don't, I don't, I consider that to your point to be a distinction without right. a difference with regard yeah. to the user no. experience. It's yes. to do with immersive so, computing per se. Yes. So it, it's, it's a transition period, right? So AR mm -hmm. will, has to come before VR reaches, you know, a point where, you know, everybody is using VR and oh, no, VR technology that. reaches okay. a point. I don't agree with you. Having, you know, I did the, the PlayStation VR for a while and too many cables and all of that stuff. But today, when uh, Keith put this thing on my head again, it does have pass-through video. 
which is really, really weird. So it is actually AR and VR to be used in different ways. But the immersiveness is so powerful and so I useful. agree. And, and the <laughs> fidelity is insane. I agree. When I, before I held the, the handsets, mm -hmm. it really tracked my hands. It's like ghost gloves around my hands, right? So yes. I, I really think that um, we're around the corner from when, don't forget, this headset is 300 pounds. <laughs> This phone that virtually everyone has is at least 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. But I use my phone less and less now, partly because of this VR. You know, I get so much in and out of this. Hey, Siri, tell my wife, when is dinner? It works <laughs> transparently, instantly, right? So th the whole headset thing, when it's a little smaller, a little better quality, and mm -hmm. when Brandel makes amazing software for it, <laughs> boom, it's going to take but, over the world but, in six months. Yeah, but you're you're you know all of you are talking from the point of view of being in a place where technology is accessible and you know the money is not it's not a huge investment to buy those things, right? But it's cheaper mm -hmm. than a mobile phone, Rafael. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, when it, I when it, I say different VR, realities. just for the it's record, I think AR. I think yeah, yeah I but, think I Again, I, I think it's moot. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not concerned with it. I'm not concerned with headsets per se. I think that we could potentially instrument entire environments with projectors. I think that pixels are, are the, the cost of pixels in general is falling through the floor. Uh, so one of the things that I, I, I like to tell people about in this context is, is Moore's Law. Now, Moore's Law, you know, was invented by Gordon Moore in the 60s in order actually, to- Actually, Brandel, for the record, he actually got it from Doug Engelbart. I'm not kidding. Yes, I'll it, it, more, more doesn't call it Moore's law. Yeah, more calls it the law of doubles or the law of or something like that. And yeah. and it, it says what, what people think it says is that you get better technology no matter what. What what it meant was based on how valuable the R and D was, people were able to move all of the money in the world in order to pull that price point down. It's not a law of it's it's less a law of physics and more a law of economics that there was value mm -hmm. in dropping the price of transistors dropping the effective price of being able to pull those things down right now virtual reality hasn't had the momentum to justify that investment hasn't captivated the imaginations of the hard science researchers that are necessary in order to make sure that price point drops and keeps plummeting in the way that it will once it starts i also think that pixels like i, I mentioned i think that projectors are an example of a thing that could have the Amour's law like kind of catastrophic price decline. I think that uh, electrophoretic surfaces, e-ink could also do that. But I think that generally things like LED strips are a, a component- I love how Brenda has, has all these things on his table ready for display. <laughs> I, I, I just, yeah, no. I, I was also gonna bring up this, but I- I, 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 I can take a part in that. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is so, so we're on the shopping network. <laughs> what I, what, one of the things I think is going to happen in the next few years and something that my wife and I are, are, are playing with at the moment is what happens when you can just have light? You know, you don't have to have, have lights. You just I have, have nature. light. <laughs> right, right. No, na nature is great. But, but nature, to your point, uh, it, it, Raphael, is also somewhat exclusive in the sense that not everybody has the same access to it. So I, yeah, I think exactly. that there are ways in which we'll be able to synthesize environments. We'll be able to create displays in, in the most holistic sense uh, that, that, that can be meant uh, that are able to tell us about the things that we need to think about and the things we need to know. Uh, I think that you know the, the one thing that, that uh, is the case within, within virtual reality is that the monitor is going away. It, it, beyond that, I don't think anybody can make any specific sort of claims or proclamations about what it's going to be. I'm I don't personally, think the monitor is going away. I think the monitor is- vision is important. So the foveal vision, you have foveal vision. Number two, you have eye movements. Number three, you have head movements. Number four, you have body movements. Each oh, one sure. the higher cost. I, I think so, it's going to be, it's more like the, the idea years back, uh, video killing the radio star. No, it didn't. It changed. It, in the, it elbowed some in, space. Oh, did you hear my radio book, interview last week? You weren't on the in radio, the book, were you? <laughs> <laughs> in the book <laughs> by Richard <laughs> Saul Worman. So Richard Saul Worman talks about in his book, The Information Anxiety, that it's not a question of or, it's going to yes. be this or that. It's a question of and. We're going to have VR, we're going yeah. to have AR, we're going to have yeah. books, we're going to have monitors, we're going to have phones, we're going yeah. to have everything all together. And you choose the ones that you know are useful for your context. 
I, mm -hmm. I partly agree. With it. I think that's it. Hang on. I think that's a really important kind of statement. I, I don't fully agree with that. By the way, Richard Saul Worman has agreed to be in our, one of our uh, things. We have to decide on when at some point. But yeah. don't forget, even though McLuhan was all about this reversing and all of that stuff, who here has a home phone still? <laughs> no. so, some media do really die. So Emily and I are watching yeah. The Good Wife. It's an amazing kind of legal drama. Highly recommend it. Watch it through. And it's so fascinating. It's only about 10, 15 years old. Hmm. People call rooms. They have mobile phones, but that's kind of for personal stuff. The, the, the use is so incredibly different. <laughs> yeah, we, we see where you are. Um, it's empty. <laughs> so so, so the, the thing that is, is getting so interesting, yes, you, you know, media, when it's digital, they're really media access points because you can get almost any digital media through anything, mm -hmm. obviously, right? So that'll be interesting. But there are a few things that are really, I mean, why is this a success? It's everything in one, right? Mm -hmm. That's partly why it's a success. I honestly think that once we have an easy to put on headset with the right environment, with the right interactions, most of these other things you're just not going to need. Mm. Yeah. When Steve Jobs launched the iPhone, I've shown this the video of this to students quite a few times because it is fascinating in terms of what people understand, what people think is the most important. He said, OK, it's a widescreen iPod and the place practically exploded. And it's a touch phone and everyone went nuts because that was all the rumors apple's going to be launching a phone and then he said and it's an internet communicator and it's like yay yeah right right <laughs> Man. yeah well so uh, on, Alan, on, yeah. on that on that point and uh, uh this actually it just occurred to me like maybe i'd like to get in on that speculative fiction group but um the point that i want to make is yeah, media uh, a lot of times sticks around. Uh, Kevin Kelly said the same thing. Uh, sometimes uh, media does get, you know, fully replaced. You know, we don't do cave drawings anymore. Um, but I think that the the conversation that doesn't happen enough, or I mean, it's unpredictable, so it's hard to. But we tend to still think in these straight trajectories, right? So to give you an example, I was thinking the other day about how there's got to be, or it's gonna be so exciting when there's a renaissance in graffiti that is stimulated or brought about because people are, or graffiti artists start using drones. And then when graffiti artists start using drones, the location becomes less of an issue and the drones are making the art. And so now totally new kinds of art is possible and totally new threats to our safety, whatever, but it's an exciting time and so these are two uh, uh, seemingly separate, you know, uh, realms, right? Uh, graffiti for personalization, you know, personal expression for art, for, for political statements, and then drones as a form of art, as an institutor of art, which could then mutate again, right, to another, uh, you might have graffiti become informational or, 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 or uh, you know, sprayed with pixels, who knows? Um, but those kinds of, like, history follows that sort of course far more often than we've invented trains now. It's very likely that we'll all personally have trains. We'll have our own train, you know, in every, in every house, uh, you know, that, so um, Linear. I, I guess I bring that up because if there's anybody, any thinker that you know of that, and Worman is himself very good at this, but uh, that can speak to those those mutations, which maybe goes back to the book you're reading, but uh, VR may very well likely be uh, completely different than how we're conceptualizing it now, because it finds a, uh, I guess my other point of that is like, for me, the, the drone and the graffiti are a perfect match, right? And whereas other systems are not good matches, like for instance, there's an app called Citizen here in the US that monitors uh, events, safety events in the, in the in your neighborhood. And it pitches that it can provide you 24 hour security or whatever, and like that's its pitch. <clears throat> but then of course, the assumption there is that when you're in time of, uh, a time of duress being, being mugged, that you would open up your app <laughs> and then you know, press the, I need an agent, right? So, so like that's a poor fit. 
Um, I, I, so I'd love to, I'd love to, I don't know, talk about and find other thoughts on the music. Let's go concept. all the way back to your first sentence, which was, we don't do cave drawings anymore. Of course we do. Graffiti in a cave is a cave drawing. But the, the reason I want to highlight it is, uh, <laughs> is um, you know, cave paintings. I was going to show you this. Cave paintings. Oh, uh, beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, it, so that, that, that's kind of yeah. fun. But, but also cave paintings were animated and 3D because they used the shape of the rock, yeah. right? So the, yeah. the planes, right. when you looked at them, would make them move. And it's an animated horse rather than two horses on top of each other. Um, the reason that's really interesting, I think, is we have to look at the intent of the communication. What is it for? That kind of communication is not to teach animal biology, probably. It's probably more about some kind of spiritual, religious, or whatever experience. Storytelling. Well, indoctrination, mm -hmm. more storytelling or atmosphere, right? So that's why I just think it's so nice when we come back to, you know, VR, will it be a normal VR? Will it be an amazing place to present the story? No question. There will be filmmakers who will be able to come up with incredible things in VR that we just can't imagine now. There's no question about that. But I think that what we're looking at here is how can we build environments to think and communicate, right? It's like it constantly has to go back to that. Sorry for ragging on and about it a little bit, but mm. but, but but what is the thing we're looking for, right? We're not going to these environments. When it comes to the deep stuff, to change someone's mind, hardly ever happens. You know, that's your point of view of the world. So that's basically religion, parents, <laughs> and school almost. You know, so so what is left? What, what what is it? Is it just filling? You know, we're all nerds. We're all curious here. Is it just filling our curiosity? You know, that's fine. But, but what are the really crucial things we can do? I mean, to me, it's, it's very much in politics to be a little superficial. People on the right tend to get a bit angry and, you know, guns to protect and all of that stuff. And then people on the left tend to be a bit disorganized. You know, that's kind of the joke. And I think that's very much true. So how do we actually manage to get people aligned to doing something? You know, this is the week of the James Webb, the greatest thing our species has ever done. It was done in near silence, hmm. right? It's, it's crazy. And the amount of money uh, on a global level, it's nothing. You compare, you know, Brian Cox has a YouTube thing where he talks about how the, all the work the entire planet is doing to prevent asteroids hitting the earth, as in, you know, to look at rockets and all of that stuff is less money than two British football teams pay their players a year. Yeah. Right? So if we even get to define the right kind of things we want to augment, that will be a huge win. Because mm -hmm. that, that in itself is really hard. So the, the, the first thing that makes me think about is, you know, we say we, we, we don't paint in caves because we, we aren't in caves. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, it ornament and we illustrate the places that we exist, the, the things that we're sensitive to and the things that we notice. Um, and uh, th I think that's an important thing to, to re recall in the context of the, the James Webb telescope as well, is that um, it barely exists for most people because of the way in which it exists. Uh, and so I think that, that the basic question is, is presence, but then also the, the question of who gets to own how different presences, different locations uh, are, are, are presented. Yeah, the question about uh, augmented reality and graffiti is, is apt because uh, right now you, you, can't, you can't graffiti digital space because there's no way, like the, the way in which it's owned is, uh, is absolute. So that you can't do anything to apple.com, only I can. Uh, and uh, that's not the case in real physical space at this point. And until somebody uh, opts in, so something like hypothesis allows you to annotate or allows people to have annotation layers over other people's digital properties. But, uh, but the, you know, the, the source of truth, the provenance of, of information within a digital space is held up as uh, a more important uh, right for the rights holders than it is for the people who are sort of observing and, and coexisting within those spaces. And so, so to, to the end that, you know, we, we have the ability to, um, and then that is also relevant within the context of the, the James Webb and sort of being able to make meaning for each other is that uh, for better and worse, that means that we don't have the ability to 
resolve and refine the meaning of what spaces are, what we do to, to make things be meaningful to each other uh, beyond the people who have those rights to those, those initial spaces. So like I said, like I can, I can resolve apple.com. So it, that means that, you know, you can't tag it. You can't uh, tagging in the sense of, of, of defacing it, but you also can't uh, provide additional meaning or you can't provide context specific meaning for specific subgroups of people for whom you might have a particular message in order to be able to translate those things. I think those are, those are, there are, are hard problems uh, to address from the perspective of all of the different rights holders, as well as the sort of the public that experiences it. Uh, and so I, I think that that's a really critical kind of component of it. Uh, and that also goes, I think, into a, another point about the way in which um, the, the tools are also selectively available um, and the way they're presented is, has a, a kind of a hard cut. Um, I really like, there's a, there's a researcher, I think she's, I'm not sure if she's at a university or if she's at Microsoft Research, but um, Felina, um, is it Wenger? Or um, uh, Felian, Felina Hermans. And she talks about um, spreadsheets and uh, and Excel and the fact that there are maybe 25 to 50 million programmers, but closer to a billion Excel users. Um, and so in order for thinking to be done, in order for tools for thought to work for, for people, then they need to be at least more like Excel than they need to be like programming. Um, yes. And, and yeah, I, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. that that's a more general. I mean, if only hypercard still existed, has so, um, with everything building tool. When when we're talking about big picture, uh, you know, dent in the universe kind of uh, motivations, um, like James Webb. For me, I don't know if this is the only one, or but this is my stab at it. This is my approach. I feel like if there's anything going on now, uh, we, we have built up so many systems that it seems like it's harder to do a thing than it should be. So I'll make, uh, I'll make a, a very naive reference point. Um, getting a job today, you have to you know, manicure your LinkedIn, your resume. You also have to go to a good school or have a great website. You know, have to go through all of these various uh, uh, the disciplines um, in order to secure X job. Whereas, you know, you might say 300 years ago, it's, oh, I know this guy and I vouch for him. Uh, so, so give him the job, right? Now, of course, the flip side of that is the, I know this guy approach works for that 1% that's already doing fairly well, right? Mm -hmm. And now, now we have the benefit of this totally distributed uh, or potential distributed, unevenly distributed space. So all of these rules and regulations sort of become, that, that becomes an obvious, that's an obvious step that you would have to take, right? When you hit that scale. Yeah. I would like to be a part of anything that removes some of those layers, but still keeps that level, still works towards that. Yes, exactly. Evening out. Oh God! Um, so and I think tools for thought is a is a is a, is one of the best ways to get there. Mm -hmm. So so many things. Okay, first of all, many years ago, my philosophy was um, well when I had Hyperwords, which was a plugin for Firefox, select text, and then you have options. Was there was a half page article in the New York Times on my work by Sarah Boxer? I will never forget her name. She completely killed it because she said this thing allows you to do anything you like with any text. So imagine you're write, reading a story and it starts with the letter V. And then she went in for the most of the article saying you can waste your entire day looking up things about the word V. And obviously the response is, well, same thing happens when you leave your front door. You can go anywhere on the planet, right? So if you're just going to wander aimlessly, fine, you'll waste time. Sometimes you want to do that. But you know, to be able to be <laughs> literate, you need to know where to go. So that's what you're saying now. There is more freedom and freedom comes with more work. That there is more freedom for more people. And right. Yeah, it is, it is a yep. more hustle, but it, but it is the effort of mm -hmm. managing the freedom. Um, also, I just put in the chat here, Colin Kaepernick on Netflix. There's two reasons I put it in. One is you all have to see it. 
It is really well done. One of my very close friends who was with us over uh, Christmas, who was not a pushy guy at all, just basically forced us to watch it. It is, it, it's about racism in America. So it won't teach you anything new. I think you're all completely aware. But the presentation is really interesting from a technical, artistic, historical, and other ways, right? That's one reason I right. put it in there. Please watch it. Second, hand, second thing is, now that I've said this in so many different ways, shouldn't we be able to instantly find in our year's worth of chats every time someone has recommended a different kind of media? Can't we do the voice tagging or something similar that we've talked about? Because that is one of the kinds of things we want to be able to extract. Like Brandel has been giving us all these good resources in this chat. You know, we're not all going to sit studiously and go through them later. What mechanism can we build? Whereas this, this is the Brandel list of stuff I haven't seen yet. Hmm. Right? How, how can we do further on that? In author reader, you know, that concept is one of the units of work, right? A recommendation, a link is also a unit of work for us and time and person. So the whole recommended by in this media, we, you know, we, we've got to find rich ways to put that automatically into a uh, thing. Yeah. And, and in some cases, I don't think it's that big of a problem to solve. I mean, there are big problems with distributed, uh, you know, crowd working togetherness. But I think a lot of the problems that we're suffering from now came from the necessity of going from zero to one in that you, 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 can, you make your own app. So you're making your own channel. So you're making your own chat and your links dump, whatever, you know? And, and that becomes your default way of thinking. This is the only way that it can work. We have to have all of these different channels. We're at a point now, and maybe this is what web four is, who knows, where we can say, take a step back and say, what, what, are, what is a, an agnostic, a way to, to, or a different way to think about, or even get rid of the idea of apps and, and just go back to, I don't know, plug-in services or something, but that's a, that's an old chestnut. I, yeah. I got another Open talk. Door. Yeah. No, maybe. <laughs> okay. I got another two minutes coming. I'm so sorry. Um, the reason I am not a programmer is probably interesting. One is I don't think I'm intelligent enough. Two I am too worried about what I write. I'm a bit um, like, I can't check things. I, I don't have, a, what, what's the thing about not being, to, I'm not dyslexic, but I can't do any proofreading of myself or anybody else's work, right? And also there are some of the, con some of the conceptual things like I write a thing and it calls a class that makes a thing possible that I now write a new sentence and it does a thing and it goes away and it comes back, no. But I, I can tell you that it's so frustrating. Yeah, but, mm. but even the mentality, but you give me Photoshop and I'll give you anything back in 10 seconds. I can fly through that thing. Keyboard shortcuts, yeah. everything, not a problem. Do this, do that. I mean, Keith has written books on Photoshop and Adobe Creative Suite integration. Um, he's done some coding too. Back but when it was Creative Suite. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. So, so the thing is that mentality of where someone, I am a super user for normal people. You know, and but I hit this ceiling that above that, I just can't do it. So is there a way to, of course, oh, it's you know, before, but is there a way to other bridge that gap or how can power go between those two things? Uh, think of the different pieces of code as gifted graduate students, each of whom is good at doing one thing and you're giving them instructions and they're coming back with the answers to your questions. That's pretty nice, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the answer was also a, a more Unix model of having smaller applications doing less that, that uh, focus on the, the, abil the ability to facilitate mm -hmm. things through plumbing. Using but like yeah. Swift is great. I've done some of the basic Swift training, but instead of having curly bracket angle, oh, you got to have a comma here, otherwise the entire world will die, right? Isn't there a way to have more, it, it, what is it called? Literate program or something where it'd say, open API so-and-so. Oh, yeah, yeah give, give it a name, fine. And then you do a line break and that means something. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically, it's it's the kind of coding that I do, which has its definite limits, but I mean, it's a 4GL, fourth generation language. It's kind of English-like. So, I mean, way more than Swift. 
Um, I mean, it's basically HyperCard is the, its roots. Um, MetaCard, which is a cross-platform thing, it's live code now. And you can kind of talk, not as in dictating, but what you if you verbalize uh, a, a nugget of a challenge, uh, you describe how to go through that challenge. You may have well has um, just spoken what you need to type in as the code. But how can you do that without what is this language? Uh, live code. What? It's called live code. Live, live code. Uh, okay. I mean, I've made yeah. Yeah, I made stuff which pulls in um, a command line library, uh, EXIF tool, and it uh, calculates and then inserts the required meta tags for 360 uh, media that's lost its metadata so that Facebook will recognize it as a 360 image. Um, and yeah, I did it using sort of basically English language coding. I call the approach oh, quasi awesome. natural language myself. Yeah. Um, to capture the fact that you're dealing with an unambiguous subset of English. So it yes. can be recognized as being English, but it's also a formal language within English, and they happen to have overlapping syntax and grammar. Yeah, the formal uh, aspect uh, really bowled me over for years, and I still uh, do not uh, do well with it. The idea of uh, it, it, it bothered me to no end when I taught myself code that you know you have a class you have to give the class a name and then you have to you know the, the redundancy that the fact that you even have values that have the same name as the class that you named it should be totally obvious you know uh and and all these things that are uh, it, i didn't find any sort of peace of mind until i i got into uh, analytic philosophy and found that oh this has been going on since 1910 you know um because because it's 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 pretty much uh, Bertrand Russell's dream is is the way that we code today. Hmm. That's my hot. Yeah, there's also a subdiscipline of psychology called psychology of programming, and there have actually been people who did studies of what kinds of naming systems work for people, what doesn't. Um, a lot of that work was relatively early on, 70s to early 80s, and then the area just sort of withered and by the wayside. I'm not sure if anyone's actively pursuing it at the moment. Uh, certainly no one's revisited the early studies. And I think you might get completely different results with today's users because we come from a much different background than the original test subjects did. Hmm. Interesting. Psychology of coding. <laughs> Dig it. Yeah, that sort of touches on something which uh, you said earlier, uh, Alan, about uh, sort of digital natives which is um, that that triggered a memory in my head but uh, the whole digital native thing you know, people those people will react so differently to the people 30 40 years ago uh, i guess it's a similar thing to the story about the first um, uh, projected film of um, in a cinema of a train coming towards the audience and everyone jumping up and running out of the cinema there is mm -hmm. one one thing I want oh, to yeah. say. So digital natives are digital natives. We're not digital natives, but this will make Fred smile because we're digital immigrants. So we're getting the job done. That's right. Yes, that was a Hamilton. <laughs> that was a Hamilton. Yeah, uh, but, 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 in there. That's but, very good. But there is there is another layer to have to have one every every chat. <laughs> yeah, it's got a minimum one. Right. Yeah, I mean, there is the thing of, you know, I would love if coding was a bit more, you have something and it becomes a, like a little pill shaped thing and then something else is this and it's more vision. That would be nice, but I still don't have the kind of intelligence that can do some of the logic. Like um, you have to go through this and sort through all these words. And if there is a word that has an extra S on it, because we're talking about plurals, then you have to do this kind of thing for that. I'm not clever enough for that. I'm I'd actually enough. disagree with that, Broad. I strongly believe that you have the full ability. You just have a mental block. And you don't recognize that you have the ability. You're sort of like Neo when he's in the Matrix and he's having that first fight in the dojo. And he thinks that he's limited by his physical abilities. And once he realizes it's all just in his head, do you think that your body matters in here? It doesn't. It's all your mind. And you can Peter, move your mind and have those powers. It's kind of it's kind of you to say that. But... Red pill, red pill. No, no, but the, the thing is, <laughs> I remember when I was working in Silicon Valley at CKS, it was a design company doing design for Apple. And you know, I know the graphic software like literally any sides of this appendage, right? 
And a client would come in and say such and such, such and such. And I'm, I'm just looking, I'm thinking, I'm literally moving a pixel in this direction and you're paying me how much by the company per hour? This is ludicrous. Why don't you just move the mouse here? For me, for my way of thinking, it was easier than walking down the street. Right. So there are very different mentalities. You know, I've worked with a lot of coders that can do magic. And then if they do their own UI, it, it looks like it was designed in 1983 on an Amiga that was broken. Right. It, of yeah. course, there are a lot of people who can do both, no question. But we need to take into account the different kinds of mindset because that's like me saying to you, Peter, here's Photoshop and here is how you make the picture of Edgar amazing in this manner. It may or may not work for you but it's the may or may not, right? Just- This has been wonderful. I have to uh, jump, but continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to- You're giving me yes. an excuse to go and make dinner for the, uh, for the family. It's gone six, yeah. Yeah, it's 6.05 here. <clears throat> All right, guys, see you on Friday. Uh, well, hang on, what day is Friday? These are crazy days. Day after Thursday? Is it? It's on Friday. It's New Year's Eve, okay. Yeah, New Year's Eve. I might not be able to make it Friday, we'll see. It'll be tough. Yeah, right? Peter, you got like a big rave to go to New Year's Eve, right? Like uh, you're gonna be, you're gonna be a tweaking on Molly. So pl please do join. It's being recorded, Alan. <laughs> Let's not tell all of Peter's secrets. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll try to be online. We're, we're going out of town on Friday to spend the New Year's Eve with some friends who I may be online or not. But anyway, love you guys, you're amazing. Thank you for this year, and I greatly look forward to next year starting in one week. Yes. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody.